Hello! Welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. I have issues with Ultimatum. What is Ultimatum? Well, it was a five-issue series back in 2009 by Marvel Comics, ostensibly designed to bring an end to its Ultimate Comics line. Except it did so in the most mean-spirited, ugly, and violent way possible. There's a lot of blame to go around, but at the end, I'm going to lay most of it at writer Jeff Loeb's feet. And as to how this came about, at the very end, I'm going to give my opinion on why it ended up being as bad as it is. But before that, I think we need to lay some groundwork so that we're on the same page in how did this series come to be, what was the plot, and then I'll illustrate each of the key failings, in my opinion, that led to this being such a uniquely terrible comic book. Let's quickly lay the groundwork on what the Ultimate Universe was. In the 1990s, Marvel Comics was hit hard by the loss of their most popular artists and a sudden and drastic decrease in the number of readers, who had gathered in the past decade to buy comics as an investment and just as quickly gave up. It left the company bloated and in financial trouble. They went through Chapter 11 bankruptcy, sold off a lot of their characters' movie rights, canceled a lot of underperforming titles, and various investors began pitching restructuring plans to banks. Ultimately, in 1998, Ike Perlmutter and his company Toy Biz was able to buy out Marvel. At that point, Marvel owned a trading card company, Fleer, and a vice president from that division, Bill Jemis, was given broad powers to help oversee Marvel. Now, personally, I'm not a fan of a lot of the moves that Bill Jemis made, and he oversaw a lot of Marvel's all-time worst comics like Marvel and Trouble. Terrible, terrible comics. But he did have one good idea, one point that I really agree with. He argued that Marvel had access to all these tremendously recognizable characters. Their sales should be much higher than they were. In his opinion, this was because of all the years of history and continuity that these characters sometimes came with. It made it intimidating for new readers to jump on. DC Comics had faced this same problem before and simply rebooted their entire line of comics. First in 1986 with Crisis on Infinite Earths and then again in 2011 with Flashpoint. Marvel has never rebooted everything from scratch, but Jemis Editor-in-Chief Joe Quesada and writer Brian Michael Bendis decided to launch a new line of comics that would start from scratch. These would be the Marvel characters, but without all the crossovers and hundreds of issues of history. It would run parallel to the existing titles. And to their credit, Ultimate Spider-Man launched in 2000, written by Bendis with art by Mark Bagley, and sold very, very well. Eventually, Mark Millar launched X-Men, Fantastic Four, and a version of the Avengers called The Ultimates, and they all did very well. But I will note that there is an inherent conflict baked into the history of the Ultimate Comics line, and that is this. Brian Michael Bendis, he was deciding to update the tropes of superhero stories for the modern age. But Mark Millar, he instead sort of had a more cynical take on it, and he was deconstructing and ridiculing to a degree those very same tropes. Now, they both created some really entertaining comics, but they were attacking it at cross-purposes. By 2009, only Ultimate Spider-Man was doing great, with the other titles slipping. So, did Marvel decide to A. Hire top talent to revive the flagging titles, B allow the characters to ride off into the sunset and end things on a high note. Or C, violently murder over 30 characters. Well, let's see. Mm -hmm. One more. They went with C. That's right, Marvel decided to hire Jeff Loeb to write the most violent and depressing thing possible. Jeff had just written an arc of the Ultimates that ended with Magneto's children, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver, dying. Scarlet Witch was killed by the evil robot Ultron, and Quicksilver intercepted a bullet that Hawkeye shot at Magneto. 
We ended that story learning that Doctor Doom had manipulated Ultron to kill Scarlet Witch, and Magneto had stolen Thor's hammer. Quick note, it's powerful and can summon storms, but in the Ultimate Universe there is no magical enchantment, so it can be lifted by others. So that story ended with Magneto furious at mankind, and that's where Ultimatum begins. I'm going to give a synopsis of those five issues and withhold any commentary for now, just giving you the bare bones of the plot just so that we can all be on the same page, and then we'll analyze things. Magneto begins this story by using his magnetic powers to create worldwide cataclysms. The first issue says it's because he affected the Earth's magnetic poles, but later issues seem to correct this, saying he moved the planet off its axis. Either way, the immediate result is a massive tsunami that hits New York, flooding it and killing millions, including many superheroes. Spider-Man spends the event just saving lives and isn't overly connected to the main plot. Surviving members of the Ultimates and X-Men organize to go after Magneto. Meanwhile, Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four is positive Namor the Submariner did this and beats him up then visits Dr. Doom, who reveals his plan was to anger Magneto and cause chaos, then step in and take over the world. Biting my tongue, no commentary, moving forward. Dr. Doom reveals that Nick Fury knows how to stop Magneto, but he had been exiled to another dimension in a previous issue. Doom and Reed travel there and retrieve Fury. While the remaining superheroes battle Magneto, Fury arrives and Jean Grey telepathically reveals to Magneto what Nick Fury knows, and that is that mutants like Magneto and the X-Men are not an evolution, but instead the result of a failed attempt by Fury to replicate the Captain America Super Soldier project decades ago. Magneto is devastated and gives up the will to fight. Cyclops murders him. Later, the Thing shows up to Doctor Doom's castle and murders him for orchestrating the plot that led to so much death. Finally, Cyclops gives a public speech in which he is assassinated, and we end with a scene revealing Quicksilver is still alive and he killed Cyclops and is ready to take on his father's work. Those are the essential plot points. Now let's dig into why, in my opinion, Ultimatum did not work. Number one, the amount of death. Who told Jeff Loeb that he needed to kill off so many characters? Don't get me wrong. If the title is ending, I think that any character should be eligible for this fate. However, it's so many. Here's a list of characters that die in Ultimatum, not including those that were later told died off screen or characters that came back to life. Beast, Dazzler, and Nightcrawler all drown in the giant wave. Professor X is killed by Magneto. Wasp is eaten by Blob, then Hank Pym kills Blob in revenge. Hard Drive, Forge, Longshot, and Detonator are tortured and killed in the Savage Land by Mystique, working for Magneto, all off panel. Cannonball, Emma Frost, Polaris, Sunspot, and Hank Pym are all blown up by Multiple Man. Thor sacrifices himself to Hela. Angel is eaten by Sabretooth. Doctor Strange is killed by his archenemy, Dormammu. Wolverine is ripped apart by Magneto. And, as mentioned in the synopsis, Magneto, Doctor Doom, and Cyclops are all killed in what amounts to an epilogue in the final issue. On top of this, other characters including Daredevil, Juggernaut, Franklin Storm, Lorelei, and more die in tie-in issues to the story. Killing characters raises the stakes of a story. But, when you get to the point where an average of five characters an issue are getting killed off, I think the law of diminishing returns kicks in and it stops meaning anything. Uh, I think this might have happened because Jeff Loeb was maybe trying to mimic Mark Millar's work. And Mark Millar's stories can be dark and cynical, but I think that Millar was always trying to at least deconstruct comic book tropes and ground things. And I think Jeff Loeb maybe just took that surface sheen of sort of violence and negativity and just applied that to his story. Which brings me to my next point. Number two, the violence. It isn't just that characters are dying, it's how violently they die. We have three characters that are all killed by being eaten. The most disgusting is Blob eating Wasp. 
it's just gross and needless. But then, Hank Pym bites off Blob's head, and Sabretooth eats Angel. What's with all this cannibalism? Was it briefly in vogue in 2009? I think not. No, instead, it's just crossing a line where it just becomes garbage. You know, I mean, the Blob eating Wasp and then getting his head bitten off in return? If I had to critique only one thing about Ultimatum, it's the over-the-top violence that doesn't really serve a purpose. Characters like Nightcrawler and Daredevil are killed off-panel, and their corpses are found by friends. These characters are likely someone's favorites, but they're treated like collateral damage. One of the most visceral examples of this is Magneto ordering multiple men to wear suicide vests and run around blowing up both superheroes and innocent civilians. This kind of realistic violence should really only be used if we're going to explore it in some way, but instead, it's a throwaway move designed to wipe the board clear of a bunch of players. Doctor Strange losing to his enemy Dormammu would be brutal enough, but the way it's done involves Strange being choked, turning purple, and having his head explode. These deaths are like something out of a Friday the 13th movie, where each death is increasingly creative and violent, but tonally, that doesn't fit with this superhero story. It's not like the antagonist is some sort of horror movie monster. Magneto gets his arm cut off, is impaled by Wolverine's claws, and survives that, only to have his head pulped by Cyclops. It's all just a bit of overkill. Number three, wasted potential. The most frustrating part about Ultimatum is that there are good ideas that aren't adequately explored, so it ends up getting your hopes up and then it goes nowhere. For instance, Valkyrie is killed by the tsunami, and Thor journeys to Valhalla to battle Hela and bring her back. While he's down there, Captain America shows up, because he was also caught in the tsunami and is on death's door. So we have a really exciting moment of Thor and Captain America tearing through Hela's army of the dead. But then Hela tells Thor that in order for a life to be brought back, another life must stay there. Captain America is like, you came here together, trading your life doesn't really make sense, but Thor does it anyway. And Captain America just comes back to life. And then Magneto later slashes Valkyrie's throat, but after Ultimatum, we're told that she survived. You wouldn't necessarily even know that within just this story. Then there's the fact that Magneto has Thor's hammer, and he never uses it once. It's always sitting there next to him, and we think, oh man, the villain has such an ace up his sleeve with that thing, but no. He never uses it. Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four are both mostly operating on the edges of the story, and only Reed Richards affects the story in any meaningful way. Don't get me wrong, I prefer Spider-Man acting like an actual hero and saving lives, but within the pages of the five issues of Ultimatum, he doesn't do much of anything. The central revelation that stops Magneto is that his kind, mutants, aren't an evolution, but a scientific mistake. I think this sacrifices a lot about what makes the X-Men unique for the sake of a quick surprise resolution. If the X-Men are born mutants and have to deal with prejudice, that's something any minority, or person that feels isolated at least, can relate to. But this tells us that they're just a brief result of science gone amok. This was done to them, and they really are just anomalies. Ouch. David Finch is a popular artist, but here, he isn't always allowed to operate at his best. We have covers with people standing. We have two separate two-page spreads that show a face. And this one doesn't even have great proportions. Look at how small Scarlet Witch's nose and mouth are. And if we're talking about proportions, check out Finch's take on Carol Danvers. Good lord. In the regular Marvel Universe, Carol Danvers is half-human and half-Cree, and she becomes Captain Marvel. But in the Ultimate Universe, apparently Carol Danvers is half-silicone. There are some good action scenes and character work, but it's not his best work overall, so it smacks of more wasted potential. Number four, poor characterization. The poor characterization, combined with all the shock value deaths, make this whole series feel like fan fiction. And I'm left looking at it going, how can this be by the same writer that created Batman The Long Halloween? Almost everyone has moments that don't feel right at all. Hank Pym has a scene trying on his new yellow jacket suit, and his wife Janet, aka the Wasp, is hanging out with him. 
Hawkeye asks how Janet can be with him, which is a fair question since Hank used to beat her. But Hank just tells Hawkeye to butt out, and that's all the explanation we get. Yeah, why would Wasp suddenly be back with Hank? It doesn't really make any sense. I think this might have been done so that we, the reader, would think, oh, okay, their relationship is back to being stable, so that's why Hank cares when Wasp is killed. But they could have split up, and Hank still could have been the wife beater that he is, and he still could have cared that Wasp was killed. It just doesn't really make sense the way they present it. One of the key elements of the Magneto-Professor X dynamic is that they have completely different views but still respect one another. They want to be friends and find a common ground. In this story, Magneto visits Professor X seemingly to have one of their philosophical debates. When Professor X accurately points out that Magneto has killed millions like several famous dictators, Magneto loses his temper and snaps his supposed friend's neck. That's a pretty extreme reaction, and a tough one to believe in. Doctor Doom is supposed to be one of the smartest men alive, but his plan is sloppy and ridiculous. He wanted to provoke Magneto to go crazy, but had no idea how much damage he would cause. And yet, he also still planned on being able to easily step in at some point and conquer the world. There's no details there that make this plan plausible. In fact, Magneto's acts caused Doctor Doom's country to flash freeze, killing all of his citizens. Cue the slow golf clap for Doctor Doom. The X-Men organize to take on Magneto, but Cyclops tells Angel he can't join them because he's too close to all of this. But that makes no sense. All of the X-Men just lost half their teammates and Professor X. Angel had been dating Dazzler, but when a dozen teammates and their mentor are all dead, is Angel really somehow significantly more distraught than the rest of the X-Men? When Wolverine confronts Magneto, he says that all the other times they fought, he'd been holding back because he was afraid to die, but now he'll win because he's willing to die. I don't know how that makes sense. But Magneto first uses his powers to aim Iron Man's repulsor ray and Cyclops' visor at Wolverine. Quick pause. Magneto can control metal, so yeah, he could make Iron Man's arm aim at Wolverine, he could make Cyclops' visor open up, but how does he make Cyclops keep his eyes open? How does he make uh, Iron Man's circuitry turn on so that the repulsor ray fires? I don't get it. Despite Iron Man and Cyclops both having force blasts that usually knock their opponent back, in this case, they blast off almost all of Wolverine's flesh. Despite basically just being a skeleton, he's still talking, which is absolutely ridiculous. Then Magneto remembers that he can control metal, and that Wolverine's skeleton is coated in metal, and he kills him with the wave of an arm. Because of course he does. Number five, no real plan. Everything about this story makes me think they wrote it on the fly, which couldn't have happened since they advertised it a full year ahead of time, and Loeb set up a few elements in the Ultimates comic that came out before Ultimatum. But look at this stuff. Magneto has Thor's hammer and never uses it. In issue 3, Magneto says he has a secret plan for Mystique to play a part in, and she never does anything in the story after that. They titled the book Ultimatum, but no one in the five issues ever issues anything close to an Ultimatum. Now, if Magneto had said to the world, give me a country where all the mutants can live peacefully, or I'll destroy everything and kill millions of people, that'd be an ultimatum. No one issues an ultimatum anywhere. The title doesn't make sense. And finally, there's the fact that it closes with Loeb writing his thanks to Bendis, Miller, Jemis, and Casada for creating the Ultimate Universe and acting like everything is wrapped up. But then the stories continued for another six years. So yeah, that's Ultimatum. And I don't think it serves any purpose other than to give us five issues of superheroes suffering and dying. It's just bad. So we look at that and we say, how did this come to be? Like, how did this happen? Well, I have two theories. Let's see if they're right. Who knows? First of all, I don't think anyone was really taking the reins of the Ultimate Comics at this point in time. I don't think anybody had the reins. Uh, we had, Bill Jamis had left like five years ago. He'd been fired by Marvel back around 2004, so he wasn't in the picture anymore. 
Joe Casada was busy running the entire line. He wasn't going to focus on just, you know, two or three books. He was running the entire picture at this point. Uh, now, Brian Michael Bendis, you know, he had a stake in the Ultimate line, but he was mostly only interested in writing Ultimate Spider-Man. That was his title. That was his baby. He was very, very heavily involved in just that book. And Mark Millar, who had launched stuff like Ultimate's Fantastic Four and X-Men, he'd moved on years ago. So he wasn't in the picture. So nobody was really left guiding the ship, saying this is where the Ultimate Comics should go, or this is how Ultimate Comics should end. Everything was just moving forward on momentum. Uh, I don't think that there's any better point to that than the fact that after Ultimatum, the books kept going for like six more years. So it didn't end. I mean, it was clearly designed to be an end, but it ultimately didn't serve to be an end. Second, uh, and this is a little, this is a little sad, but Jeff Loeb's son had passed away a few years before, and I believe that it affected his writing. I'd be open to your take if you disagree with me on this, but I think if you look at the stuff that he was writing, like Batman and Daredevil with uh, artist Tim Sale, and then you compare it to stuff like The Ultimates, Ultimatum, uh, his work on the Hulk with the Red Hulk, I think that things for a few years there definitely were more cynical and dark. That's my two cents. Um, I think it affected his writing and it might have led to Ultimatum being more violent and ugly than it needed to be. Ultimately, I think, <laughs> ultimately, I think that this was a tremendously bad five issues and I would actually place it in the absolute worst of all comics in the decade of the 2000s. Some of the worst of the decade. That's just how I feel. I don't love spewing vitriol. Next week, I'll be back with something more positive. Until then, thank you for watching. Keep reading comics.